Thank you everyone for joining us for today's panel, Incarcerated While Trans, Violence, Discrimination, and Other Challenges in Confined Settings. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, our staff attorney, Will Tintendo. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kim, for that introduction. As they said, my name is Will Tintendo. I'm a staff attorney at the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law. And I have the honor of moderating today's panel, Incarcerated While Trans, Violence, Discrimination, and other challenges in confined settings. Before we begin, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. I am calling in from, and the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law is located on the ancestral and unceded land of the Gabrielenio and Tongva peoples, who are the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanukvatam, Ahi Harom, and Ayo Hikem, our ancestors, elders, and relations, past, present, and emerging. To frame our conversation today, in 1994, the Supreme Court heard the first case brought by a transgender person, D. Farmer. That case concerned the cruel and unusual punishment inflicted by the prison system onto her, and was the first time the Supreme Court mentioned the issue of sexual assault in prisons. Almost 30 years later, and D's groundbreaking case remains a cornerstone in Eighth Amendment litigation and advocacy for the rights of transgendered people in confined settings. Today, we have a group of experts together, including Dee herself, to discuss the challenges facing people who are held in confined settings, such as prisons, jails, and immigration detention, and bringing into discussion the role that researchers, lawyers, and advocates may have. Before we begin, I'd like to say that we will have questions, at, we will be able to answer questions at the end of today's conversation, but if you have any questions during the course of the panel, please submit them using the Q&A function on the Zoom, and our panelists may be able to address them during our regular conversation. Also, I'd like to say that today's conversation will have some um, potentially triggering topics, such as violence and sexual assault that people who are incarcerated may experience. And with that, with no further ado, I'd like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, today, we're going to hear from Dee Farmer, Dee Dangaran, A.D. Lewis, and Liz Kavach. And just for the ease of coordinating this over Zoom, could each of our panelists please introduce themselves in that order? And starting with Dee, welcome. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dee Farmer. I was the first uh, transgender litigant to have a case accepted and ruled upon by the United States Supreme Court. Um, I'm currently the executive director of Fight for Justice. I'm also a legal consultant for several um, LGBT uh, organizations that works on trans rights. Hi, everyone. My name is Dee Dangaran. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm from Hawaii, but I work in Washington, D.C. I'm the director of gender justice at an organization called Rights Behind Bars. We bring affirmative litigation and appeals representing people on the inside. Um, I have a focus on trans rights on the inside. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the National Trans Bar Association. So grateful to be on this panel and to see some great familiar faces. Hi, everyone. My name is A.D. Lewis. I use he, him pronouns. And I founded and run the Trans Beyond Bars Project at the Prison Law Office. The Prison Law Office is um, a nonprofit law firm based in California, and we sue state prison systems and jails about conditions of confinement, disability, medical care, restrictive housing, et cetera. Um, and I work on trans issues spanning our cases. And it's amazing to be here with Dee and Dee and uh, Liz, too. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Liz Kavach and my pronouns are she and her. I'm a family physician and associate professor of family medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and medical director of the LGBTQ plus health services for Denver Health, which is the county safety net system in Denver, Colorado. I also provide consultations for gender affirming hormone therapy for trans and non-binary folks who are in immigration detention locally as well as performing forensic medical exams for trans and queer folks seeking asylum through the Denver Health Human Rights Clinic. 
I um, am excited to talk about my research project today that was funded by the Williams Institute, um, but I'm also very profoundly grateful and humbled to be here with my co-panelists who do such, a, do such incredible work and most especially Ms. Farmer, and I look forward to learning from you all today. Amazing, thank you all. I'm so excited to begin our conversation now and um, I'd like to start by talking to Dee Farmer. Our conversation today is in many ways possible because of your efforts as a self-represented plaintiff in Farmer v. Brennan, which the ACLU once referred to as one of the most important trans victories you've never heard of. For those listening who do not know, could you please explain the history of your case and how it reached the Supreme Court? Sure. Um, Farmer versus Brennan um, actually began um, over 40 years ago, um, when I was a teenager, um, convicted of nonviolent fraudulent crimes, uh, committed to custody for 50 years, went into the federal prison system, immediately was horrified by the inhumane and lack of dignity commenced uh, litigation just by pure reading and talking to others and learning by experience, um, which resulted in retaliation from prison officials, which caused me to end up being transferred to a number of different prisons. And those were transfers that I got uh, for disciplinary reasons, basically retaliatory disciplinary reports were written um, against me for minor things, not being in my cell all the time, not having my shirt tucked in. And those transfers were always to higher security institutions. I ended up in the maximum security institution in Indiana, which was very violent. I was there uh, one week before inmate came into my cell uh, with a knife, demanded that I had sex with him. And when I refused, he uh, beat me severely and raped me. Um, I was consequently placed in protective custody where I got to witness um, sort of inmates coming in and out of segregation and protective custody for fear, for sexual abuse, and it was just like uh, almost epidemic within the within that prison. And um, the way that I spent my time, I was in protective custody for a year, was going to the law library every day, and just at first just to get out the cell, and then uh, just became very interested in the law, spent almost eight hours there daily, just pulling down books, reading cases. And when I finally got transferred, I decided to file a lawsuit about the vulnerability of people in violent prisons. And it was throughout of court almost immediately. And I continued to appeal, eventually reaching the Supreme Court where the case was accepted. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, can you tell me more about your experience of at the Supreme Court and working with the ACLU at that stage and then the impact of the Supreme Court, what the Supreme Court decided and kind of the impact of that decision that's continued to reverberate to today? Sure. Um, so after I filed the initial petition, um, there was some indica indication that the Supreme Court was interested in the case because the uh, clerk sent a letter requesting the entire record on behalf of the justices. And at that point, I asked the ACLU if they would represent me. They said, yeah. Um, and so they uh, entered the appearance and the case went forward. The decision um, came down, you know, that prison officials could be held liable. Um, and during the process, um, the ACLU had me uh, transfer to a less security, more program type institution. And there, um, I just began to um, work almost, you know, daily with uh, transgender inmates, uh, creating support groups, trying to help them with name changes, uh, you know, trying to uh, help 
all of us get uh, hormone therapy, filing multiple suits on behalf of transgender inmates. And I think, you know, from Farmer versus Britain, uh, more transgender inmates certainly started to um, feel empowered to litigate their rights, to stand up for their rights. And I think that over the decades, we have just seen that evolve to what we see today, um, transgender rights everywhere. Amazing. I think that actually would be a good segue to talk more about your work now, too. And, um, you know, trans people who are in confined settings, such as prison and jails, face a wide range of issues. So what might not people in the audience realize about trans people who are inside and what they need? So what I have found to be the most significant lacking for trans incarcerated people and perhaps um, LGBTQ people in prison in general is the lack of rehabilitative programs that address their specific needs. Um, not only that they uh, be provided with the medical care, um, the gender affirming care that they want, but also that they are in need of uh, life skill training. They are in need of counseling and programs and mental health therapy, drug abuse treatment. They need the programs that will allow them to live successfully and their queer or gender uh, differences. And they need the re-entry programs that when they come out of prison, that will help them to accomplish that. And I find that that is lacking across all prison systems. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think that we're also going to hear more about that too with D and AD's discussion later. I would like to ask you um, if you could talk about the claims that you brought to the Supreme Court for those people in the audience who might not be lawyers, if you could explain kind of the importance of Bivens' claim in Section 1983 and how um, you went about advocating for yourself at that time. Sure. So, um... 1983 um, does not apply to federal prisoners. Um, the federal courts held many decades ago that 1983 was applicable to uh, hold liable um, state actors acting under state law. And of course, in the federal prison system, they are acting under the color of federal law. And so 1983 does not apply. And so the Supreme Court created a special remedy um, for liability of federal officials. Um, it's kind of a high standard to meet but it, the first, the case upon which they established that was called Bivens versus Six Unknown Federal Agents. And so the uh, liability claims are now known as Bivens claims. And so that's what uh, my claim was under Bivens. But the, the request or claim to actually change the policy of the federal system was considered a federal question, you know, whether that policy violated the Constitution and federal law, which was under 28 U.S.C. 1331. Wow, thank you. I think we're going to talk more about Bivens claims and kind of how Farmer v. Brennan shifted that and that president has shifted over the last almost 30 years. But I want to ask you personally, when you reflect on the impact of your advocacy, what or who do you think about? Your case has, has such an outsized impact on the law. Um, it's crazy. Um, one of my uh, most ins inspirational persons, um, I guess it was not necessarily her, but just her theory was uh, Sandra Day O'Connor that the Constitution um, is evolving to meet today's uh, standards of decency. 
And so I think that today we find that incarcerated trans people and incarcerated people in general <clears throat> are uh, more normalized and seen more as, uh, you know, worthy of dignity and just humanity. And I think that, um, you know, as the society has evolved to recognize this and whether it has come through scientific research or just through pure advocacy um i think that we, you know her philosophy has become more and more true and that we are you know even though we're still fighting to um, see that that humanity and dignity is upheld and provided, um, that has been one of my biggest inspirations and continues my, to be inspirational for me today. Thank you. And I think actually that's a really good segue too. I'd like to talk about the Supreme Court again, because just about two weeks ago, um, the ACLU and advocates from Tennessee and the United States the Biden administration filed petitions for certiorari to the Supreme Court in cases challenging Tennessee's gender-affirming care ban for minors. And what I'd like to ask you, Dee, in discussing you know, the concept of humanity and, and from the Supreme Court's perspective, what is important for lawyers and advocates to understand about bringing the needs of transgender people before a judge? And what might the court not need? What does the court need to understand as well? Would that be D Farmer or D Dangran? Oh, sorry, D Farmer. But I, I got it. D Dangran wants to chime in as well. But no, D. Yeah, I'd like to ask you, as someone who brought a case representing themselves to the Supreme Court. Um, I think that in all cases, um, whether um it's involving uh, trans individuals or just um, plain violations of constitutional rights. I think that it's important for the court to not necessarily uh, just understand the legal claim that is presented, but to really understand the significance of the facts and the damages that the damaging that is done to the individual who is, you know, bringing the claim, the plaintiff, the prisoner, um, you know, the realistic damage to that person. Um, and I think that a lot of times if you need to first get that very clear, clearly before the court so that they can really sort of, uh, coincide that with the, uh, you know, why the law should prohibit that kind of thing from happening to an individual. Yes, excellent. That's such a great perspective. And I think that's also a really great way that we can now talk to Dee Dangran and A.D. Lewis. You know, you both are attorneys representing trans people who are incarcerated. So I think it'd be great to get both of your perspectives on what you hear from your clients about their needs, your perspectives on the development of case law since Farmer. And I know that Dee, you prepared some slides, so I think it would be great if we could start um, around with your slides and then move into a discussion around those questions. Yes, um, I'm not sure if the tech team was able to figure out a way to put them up. If not, I can share my screen right now. Yeah, um, I think it'd be, if you can share your screen, I think that would okay. be great. Got Thank it. You. So I, there are way too many slides I have here than to do a full presentation. Um, so I'll zoom through most of these. Um, I believe I want to do presenter view, but I'm not. Can, you can see my notes this way, can't you? Yes, yeah. okay, one second. There we go. Um, so this is, I think hopefully we'll be able to send this out afterwards so folks can come back to it if they want to. Um, is that possible, Will? I think so. If, if people are interested in the slides afterwards, um, they could certainly email the Williams Institute and we could distribute them that way. That might be the best way. Great. So this uh, set of slides I've made covers all of these components of trans rights behind bars, um, but I want to jump to where Dee just left us. Um, but first, thinking about her case, um, the Prison Rape Elimination Act that Congress passed references Farmer versus Brennan. So Congress was 
well aware of what was going on inside of facilities when they passed the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, and Dee brought her case to national attention. Um, you know, Farmer held that a prison official cannot escape liability for deliberate indifference by showing that while he was aware of an obvious substantial risk to a person's safety or health, um, such as a feminine trans woman in a men's facility, um, uh, he did not know that the complainant was especially likely to be assaulted by a specific person. There, It's an obvious uh, fact that someone would be at risk um, in such a setting. And so Farmer was really strong and Priya kind of gave some uh, factual findings and data that supported what we knew that Dee and others went through. Um, and so sadly, despite Priya's passage and Dee's case, the numbers don't look much better today. Um, we have 1,200 trans people in federal prison, and these are the numbers that came out of Priya's uh, factual findings. Um, the DOJ found that 40% of trans people inside have been sexually assaulted, which is 10 times the rate of the general prison population. We don't have um, those same data for people in states, but we do know the numbers of people, at least from that one NBC report. Um, and so we can maybe assume this kind of higher rate of sexual assault across the board for trans people. The you know, avenues that we do have are using our grassroots networks to figure out what people on the inside need who are already in touch with. So Black and Pink National, um, Lambda Legal has worked with Black and Pink National on other surveys since this one. Um, but in 2015, uh, Black and Pink's uh, leader, Jason Lydon, issued this report. Um, and when thinking about sexual assault inside, you know, it's happening by uh, other people who are incarcerated as well as by staff. Um, and so even if we were to, for example, transfer all transgender women to women's facilities in the thought that the people who are incarcerated with them are um, the ones who are putting them at risk, I think the staff uh, sexual violence and sexual harassment um, is still going to be a problem that we have to think about seriously when we think about the remedies for um, what we're considering right now. Um, and surveys like this and other studies have shown that in general, Priya is seen as somewhat ineffective. Um, I, you know, we can debate whether it served its purpose in trying to get states to change their policies, but from what people experience, Priya is often used in ways that punish them, uh, publish people who try to report situations. Um, and it's also wielded in a way um, that it's not intended to prevent, that when people have consensual interactions, Priya is used against them, even in those co contexts. Um, I know from speaking to some trans people who are in uh, men's facilities, they're not even able to bring their Priya reports forward. Um, and so if the facility doesn't want to do kind of the full implementation, implementation of Priya, it really will not have much teeth. So... As Dee said, her case was a Bivens claim, and um, it expanded Car Carlson versus Green's medical deliberate indifference um, protection for people on the inside. Um, just to be really, really clear here, it's a it's a federal damages claim. So it's when an individual federal officer um, does harm, and you want to get damages there, and often. Um, the remedy for folks after the damage has been done is really money damages or bust. Um, my organization argued this third circuit case called Shorter versus United States um, that ensured that despite the kind of way that the Supreme Court has been chipping away at the Bivens uh, cases um, from Ziglar versus Abbasi to Hernandez versus Mesa, um, and most recently in Egbert versus Bully, um, that Farmer was a Bivens context, that Farmer was an understood case that showed uh, a failure to protect claim could have uh, money damages in a federal setting. Um, the Fourth Circuit disagreed with that in 2023, and I argued a case in the Ninth Circuit this year as well, and the Ninth Circuit decision also just disagreed with that. Um, Kalu versus Spalding was argued literally last week. Um, and the Third Circuit's now revisiting Shorter and Bistrion and considering removing this damages remedy 
for people who have a failure to protect claim as D brought. And so it's not a, a, an optimistic picture. Um, the Supreme Court has shown that it's not interested in expanding the Bivens context besides beyond three cases. Um, it's a Fifth Amendment sex discrimination claim, Carlson, which is Davis versus Passman, Carlson versus Green, which is uh, this Eighth Amendment medical care context, and the Bivens, quintessential Bivens case, which is excessive force. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I have a couple of arguments left trying to say that what uh, failure to protect is should be protected, but losing in the Ninth Circuit was was really a toughie. Um, I think that the the next step is going to be how far we can expand Carlson to extend to other sorts of what what exactly is a medical deliberate indifference because in Carlson um the the person who was not who did not receive care died and so there's an open question whether um you need to die because of your inadequate medical care or if it's enough to not receive um something that you need that caused it caused you some form of harm um so it's it's you know really sad to see that these years since um, D's win um, has shown a more a very recent Supreme Court uh, becoming more hostile to claims from people um, seeking damages. But besides those federal official damages claims, you can still seek injunctive relief using the standards and the doctrine of Farmer versus Brennan, and you can similarly um, seek damages claims against state officials, as you said, under 42 USC section 1983. And so some of the things that you can argue as a trans person on the inside are a conditions of confinement claim under the Eighth Amendment. And these are some of the things that you might be interested in asking for. Um, having a facility transfer um, that is not, uh, you know, a sex that you were assigned at birth, but is the sex that you identify with now and would feel safer in. Um, shower time, single cell housing, electrolysis. These are all things that some of my clients have sought and commissary items remain a need because of social transition being a, a necessary part of an individual's transition. Um, and the medical care cases, I think, include some of those things, right? You can argue that commissary items and transfer are medical needs. Um, the W the World Professor, Professional Association for Transgender Health provided the standards of care that have been updated since they were first issued, um, and some circuits um, have found these to be uh, the medical standard of care. Um, and I think that you know we can debate the pros and cons of that, but when we have individuals like Dr. Stephen Levine trying to say on the other end that what trans people are asking for is almost never medically necessary and kind of going off the deep end um, with his former role on the W path you being used against those who are trying to advocate for, for trans health care on the inside. I think everything that we can possibly bring to the table um, will be necessary to continue to give people protection. Um, so in the Eighth Amendment deliberate indifference context, this is kind of what's happened over time, a slice of it from a circuit level um, in Eighth Amendment medical deliberate indifference cases. Um, so in the First Circuit, you have um, gender affirming surgery denied uh, because there were two adequate options. And that remains kind of the element to the Eighth Amendment standard that is really tough. That if a doctor says, well, I treated them with um, uh, hormone treatment, and so they didn't actually need surgery. I was treating their gender dysphoria already. And, you know, I found and the, the mental health professionals found that the surgery was not actually necessary. That's enough of a medical disagreement that we can't call that deliberately indifferent. Um, in the Fifth Circuit, we have what's really the worst case in the doctrine um, in Gibson. And it was a de facto ban on gender affirming surgery. Um, so in other contexts, a blanket ban, like in, in uh, you know, it, it's pretty really obvious that a blanket ban on providing care um, is deliberately indifferent because you're not conducting an individualized assessment of what a person needs. But the Fifth Circuit found that a blanket ban on providing gender affirming surgery is not deliberately indifferent because it has not been found that surgery is ever medically necessary. Um, and so then you have the Ninth Circuit coming in Edmo really pushing back against Gibson and saying that gender affirming surgery was necessary in that case. So it therefore can be medically necessary. Um, 
and that the prison medical officials there did not uh, provide the treatment that the plaintiffs needed. Um, and Keohane was the 11th Circuit case. It, it In an earlier version of that case, there was a freeze frame policy at issue. Um, they were not uh, providing HRT, period. Um, but that changed over time. And so this was in Florida, there was a blanket ban on providing any form of care. Um, they removed that policy, but Keohane still kind of relied on Kosilek to say that, well, this was in, in this individual's case, um, nothing here showed a necessary social transition. So we're not going to require um, these specific things. And I think, you know, with this split, we can really question whether the Supreme Court would get involved. And I think a lot of movement lawyers, from my understanding, want to avoid that with all costs. Um, and so fear getting to this level um, in other cases. And so given the Eighth Amendment's kind of treacherous ground right now, something that seems really interesting and is kind of a developing area of law is using the Americans with Disabilities Act for those trans people who have a gender dysphoria diagnosis to seek the various forms of medical care they might need. Um, this was first brought in the District of Massachusetts in 2018 by GLAAD um, and recently was brought in the Fourth Circuit. Um, and I forgot to include here, but AD will talk about the fact that the Supreme Court um, uh, denied cert in the Fourth Circuit's case. Um, and so the basic outline of the ADA claim is that uh, if once you define gender dysphoria as the disability, um, you can get what you need out of it, right? The discrimination elements come in, reasonable accommodations, and we can get there if we can get there. But the challenge right now is in defining gender dysphoria as a disability itself, because the Americans with the Disabilities Act excludes transvestism, transsexualism, pedophilia, and exhibitionism, voyeurism, and gender identity disorders not resulting from physical impairments from the definition of disability. And these terms seem really outdated to us, and it's because they are. The Americans with the Disabilities Act was passed in 1990 when a DSM was in effect that is two versions ago. DSM-3 was in effect, and that used transvestism, transsexualism, um, and this gender identity disorders not resulting from physical impairments language. In DSM-4, um, which was in effect when the Americans with Disabilities uh, Act Amendments Act was passed in 2008, all of that was kind of collapsed into gender identity disorder, um, which one could argue still fits into this disability exclusion. But in 2013, when DSM-5 was passed, gender identity disorder was removed and replaced with a new diagnosis called gender dysphoria, which was a term that was used before, but this made more clear that the, the disability that was now in the DSM um, is the distress itself, that the distress that is caused by having gender that is incongruent with your gender identity or having your sex sign at birth be incongruent to your gender identity. And so the distress used to be a component of gender identity, gender identity disorder, but now you have gender dysphoria being the distress itself, being a, its own standalone disability. Um, and so the litigation that we've seen focuses on whether this shifting terminology means the exclusion should not apply. And therefore, you can argue for Americans with Disabilities Act to protect trans people's needs who have GD diagnoses when they're on the inside. Um, I'll Please. stop there and let AD jump in about Williams versus Kincaid. And then maybe we can talk at the end about what some people have shown from the inside. Yes, perfect. I was about to just with an eye on the time. Yeah, AD. I'll be real quick. So basically, this case that's been referenced a few times is called Williams v. Kincaid. Um, it's a case brought by Kesha Williams, who's a trans woman who was detained in Fairfax County Jail. And during her detention, she experienced things that nearly every trans person in jail um, I speak with has experienced, which is she was housed not based on her gender or her sex, but rather based on her sex assigned at birth. She experienced really pervasive and intentional misgendering, um, cross-gender searches that were uh, punitive and awful, as well as being denied medically necessary care, in this case, hormones, but other types of medical care as well. 
And so after she was released, she filed this claim and she made a number of constitutional claims as well as some state common law claims. But she also argued that the Fairfax County sheriffs violated Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act by discriminating against her as a person with gender dysphoria diagnosis. And um, she also had many complaints. So there's some weird procedural stuff here, but basically the district court dismissed her complaints for a variety of reasons. Um, and one of those being that gender dysphoria is excluded from coverage under the ADA is what they held. And so it went to the Fourth Circuit. Fourth Circuit held that uh, they reversed and remanded that decision and said, no, gender dysphoria um, could be a disability under the ADA. And she's, you know, pled enough to get there. Um, and then the sheriff uh, asked for a cert, uh, asked for cert to be granted at the Supreme Court. And that was denied. Um, and so the Fourth Circuit's ruling really stands. But what's interesting about the SCOTUS denial on this is that Justices Alito and Thomas um, gave, uh, they gave their reasons for why they wanted to accept the case actually. And I think their uh, denial rationale is actually really, really important for lawyers to look at. And so there's a couple things going on that denial rationale that I think we should just pay attention to. And one is that many advocates have argued that gender dysphoria is different than gender identity disorder and transsexualism, and that those are in the ADA exclusions because of, of uh, bias and stigma. And that because of that, um, that it presents a constitutional issue of equal protection. And what Justices Alito and Thomas said was that actually the ruling as is, the idea that gender dysphoria is a protected class under the ADA gives rise to other constitutional issues like free speech and religious liberties. And so this whole doctrine of constitutional avoidance um, actually isn't really at play here because the holding as is presents other constitutional issues and concerns. And so I think when we're thinking about the massive swing right of the federal courts right now and the massive swing right of the Supreme Court itself, what you know Justices Alito and Thomas's decision is winking at is other circuit judges and how to get them to bat down this argument and say like, actually, this is a matter of a First Amendment issue, not a 14th Amendment issue. Um, and so one, I think that's an incredibly important thing for trans litigants to start to think about. But also, um, I really want to highlight here that the types of arguments that advocates are relying on to argue that gender dysphoria is different from gender identity disorder or transsexualism, um, I think are particularly harmful to trans people. And I think they're particularly harmful in ways that um, comport with lots of anti-trans bias and stereotypes. And so, you know, DNI will uh, publish some work on this actually in Harvard Law Review Forum in April. Please hit us up. We can talk about this some more. But basically, I contend that um, by focusing on this physiological basis, so that gender dysphoria um, has a physiological basis, advocates are arguing things in court, such as trans people have different brain types, they have different brain matter. Um, trans people are, and gender dysphoria is likely genetic because it happens more in families, or that trans people's endocrine system um, is impaired because it produces different types of hormones than what people identify as. And so I think those types of uh, physiological arguments, trans brain, trans gene, um, those to me are particularly concerning as a trans person, but also as someone who advocates for trans people. I don't wanna have to use bioessentialist tropes to argue why trans people deserve care and support, um, et cetera. But I also think that the impairment arguments too are very concerning because the, again, advocates are arguing that gender dysphoria impairs reproductive function, which is not true. Um, if certain types of uh, people, if, if certain types of medical intervention or gender affirming medical intervention sought like hormone therapy or like certain types of gender affirming surgeries, of course that can impact reproductive function. But there's nothing about dysphoria that necessarily impacts reproductive function. They also claim that gender dysphoria impacts like uh, your ability to uh, like care for yourself and your ability to occupationally and socially function. And like gender, the, the distress noted in gender dysphoria in the DSM, it does not matter, it, it doesn't measure whether or not, um, you know, trans, whether the impairment is anti-trans stigma and bias or like the mental impairment of, of having dysphoria. And so I think here, often what's talked about in the DSM, if you even go, if you go look at how distress is described in the DSM, it is the effects people have of anti-trans bias. And so it's how people, um, internalize and respond to negative social pressure. So we can think about the work done around the minority stress model, right? And we can really think about how trans people are impaired, not by any physiological trait, by any mental or physical impairment, but rather how anti-trans bias at the structural and interpersonal level, right? So we can think about the policies that happen in Kincaid. We can also think about the interpersonal dynamics that Ms. Williams was experiencing while she was in prison, about how those actually create debilitating life conditions and and the likelihood of violence and death that trans people experience. And so 
I really do think that, um, you know, given the swing of the courts, the ADA model is possibly one that might work some places, but I think there's major risk and potential major harm here. And that as trans advocates and as people seeking gender liberation, trans liberation, disability justice, that there's other ways to go about this argument and we can kind of shift it. Um, but I'll end there because I know we're tight on time. Excellent. No, thank you so much. And I think that D, the rest of these slides to touch on another complicating factor of this, and I, we are tight on time, but maybe if you have a minute or two to discuss what you know from people who are inside and their thoughts on the ADA claim for gender dysphoria as another complicating factor, with the mind knowing that we're going to look forward to your articles in the Harvard Law Review, which is awesome and so incredible, but yeah, quickly. Yeah, quickly, because I'm really excited to hear from Liz. Um, the Black and Pink Massachusetts uh, group um, and I conducted a survey of trans people in their membership and asked these three questions. Um, so given the complications that AD just explained and uh, the desire from some litigants, or some lawyers, I should say, to bring litigation around the ADA, I thought it would be really important to ask if people actually want that and to bring from this ground up angle to just ask the question from the legal theory standpoint to the people on the inside who would be affected by it. Um, and so someone, you know, these are, I, I have some qualitative and some uh, just quantitative data to show, and I'll, this will be really the basis of my article, um, essay rather. Um, but I do think that, you know, a lot of people found gender dysphoria is a disability, and these are some reasons that they gave for why. Um, people did acknowledge that there will be stigma attached to them um, because it's a disability and that stigma already is attached to them while they're on the inside and that they would want to bring the claim. Um, and so I don't think that just because people would bring the claim means they ought to. You know, I think that there's still some conversations to be had between lawyers and their clients, but I think it's a call to all of us if we want to be movement lawyers um, and abolitionist movement lawyers at that to really think about whether we want to uh, bring every claim that's an option or um, or not because we can see the downsides as AD laid out um, or be in conversation with our clients about it because they are experts on what they need as well as what they want to kind of be doing with the law um, as D so eloquently points out to us. Excellent. Okay, amazing. And I'd like to switch gears now to talk about another type of confined setting, immigration detention. And Liz, I was hoping you could share your findings from your policy brief, which you mentioned was supported by a small grant from the Williams Institute, and explain the harms that transgender and non-binary people face in immigration detention, and if there's anything unique to immigration detention that's not seen in other confined settings. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, before I answer the question, I just want to acknowledge the rest of our research team, Ryan O'Connell, Jenny Regeer, Catherine Valentin, Monica Adams, and Jess Martinez-Robles as well as gratitude for the grant from the Williams Institute. I also want to briefly locate myself and name my own privilege as an English speaking, US born, white, able-bodied, bisexual, cisgender woman and physician and someone who has never experienced incarceration. The views I express today are my own and not necessarily those of the organization that I work for. So this project really came about um, through the clinical work that I do that I mentioned in terms of providing consultation for folks who are detained in immigration detention for hormone therapy as well as asylum exams. And um, through mutual clients became affiliated with the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network where a couple of my co-authors are working which is a legal nonprofit that works to ensure justice and provide legal services for adults in immigration and detention and for immigrant children who have suffered abuse, neglect or violence. So from what we knew, our trans and non-binary clients and patients were telling us, um, there was extensive and pervasive maltreatment and poor conditions in immigration detention. Many trans people face unspeakable violence, persecution, and fear of death in their home countries related to their gender identity and plea to seek safety in the US, only then to be detained for months or sometimes even over years um, on, in immigration detention and suffer further abuse, discrimination, and, and some people would categorize it as torture. However, these stories are really poorly documented, both in the news media as well as in published medical literature. Um, the Department of Homeland Security issued guidelines in 2015 on the treatment of trans and non-binary people in immigration detention. These are really poorly enforced and private for-profit detention facilities that contract with the government are not required to adopt them unless it's explicitly part of their contract. 
So I think there are many similarities to experiences of trans people incarcerated in jails and prisons in the United States, but trans people in immigration detention are uniquely vulnerable because they aren't U.S. citizens and legally have fewer rights. So this intersects with experiences of transphobia, sexism, racism, xenophobia to create conditions in immigration detention that re-traumatize individuals who have already been deeply traumatized and are often fleeing um, out of fear for their lives. So they live in constant fear of deportation and um, and the result in fear if they're deported back to their home country that they might be killed. So we decided to create a research project to perform semi-structured interviews with trans people who had been released fairly recently from immigration detention about their experiences, um, as well as interviewing community organizations in the metro area I'm located in who work with trans and or um, immigrant clients and communities about the services and resources they have available and how that matches up with folks' needs when they're released. Uh, the detention facility where the majority of individuals were interviewed um, were detained is run by a for-profit company and has a specific transgender unit. So many trans people detained were transferred from other facilities. And of note, we're still working to recruit additional individuals to record as many stories as possible, but the policy brief and findings that I'm sharing today are a summary of, of our findings um, to date. So I wanted to, um, given that I am um, a vehicle and spokesperson, um, try to center some quotes and some of the voices of folks who were brave enough to share their stories. And so I'm gonna go ahead and um, verbalize the findings, kind of some major themes from our study, but also wanted to put up some direct quotes from folks um, while I'm talking. So, um, one of the major themes that we found were um, pervasive experiences of torture, abuse, and discrimination. So trans people commonly experience torture, abuse, and discrimination related to their gender identity and detention facilities from detention officers, medical and mental health staff, and other typically cisgender people who are detained. This includes being misgendered and misnamed, which was compounded by having discordant identity documents. Trans women, I think, are especially vulnerable if they've taken hormone therapy in the past, um, describing having their breasts and genitals grope during strip searches and told they would be sent back to their home country if they didn't submit to it. It was common for individuals to be transferred between multiple facilities after presenting themselves to border patrol to seek asylum and then abuse occurring at these interim facilities. <clears throat> Individuals were often not given a, a choice of housing and may be forced to stay with other people who are detained of the same birth, birth sex, especially in transit, which increases the risk of abuse and sexual assault, especially for trans women. In facilities that have a, a specific trans unit, trans people are preferentially housed together, but if there's only one trans person detained in the facility at the time, then that individual is effectively placed in solitary confinement for long periods of time, sometimes upwards of months, which um, is considered by many to be a human rights abuse. Trans people detained often have described having inadequate medical and behavioral health care, including gender affirming care. People are forced to undergo unnecessary psychological evaluations um, for comparison to guidelines, including the WPAS standards of care to obtain hormone care therapy, even if they were previously treated with it and face significant delays, sometimes um, uh, months or up to a year before receiving consultations to obtain it. Facilities often require prior medical records to continue hormone therapy but if they were, even if they were in another detention facility where this is documented from the medical records, it can take weeks or months to get the records and individuals are, have to stop hormone therapy in the meantime, which negatively impacts uh, mental health and can and certainly increase suicidality. Many trans people in other countries use non-prescribed or self-managed hormones, so records are not available, even if they have visible, irreversible, um, physical effects that they've been on hormone therapy. And medical providers and facilities certainly do not have the training to offer this care. So if there are not consultation resources available at consulting medical institutions, um, then the barriers to care are very high. Individuals and organizations um, specifically reported inadequate provision of care uh, for people living with HIV, especially during the pandemic. And this included people not receiving antiretroviral therapy as well as treatment for other chronic conditions. Other themes included being forced to engage in unpaid labor in the facility, including cleaning of bathroom facilities with inadequate personal protective equipment during the pandemic, and being threatened to have basic needs withheld if they didn't engage in the labor. Retaliation by officers was reported by interviewees for attempting to report abuse and unsafe conditions. 
And detention times, um, statistically for trans people who are in immigration detention are two to seven times longer than the average cisgender person detained. And this was corroborated by our interviews. So in closing, before I, um, I'm happy to take any questions, I, I would also just like to apply a strength-based lens and note that these individuals are some of the most resilient humans I've ever met. And these are um, a couple of their thoughts on things that they felt um, should, should change in the system. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Liz, I think we're gonna move into the Q&A portion, but I'd like to just ask you as well as part of this. So if anyone else has any questions, please share them in the Q&A feature. But um, you know, your policy brief and you just discussed the experience of trans and non-binary people receiving medical care as a doctor yourself, can you explain how people receive this care and what's going wrong in more detail? Sure, absolutely. Hold on, let me just clear up my slideshow. Um, so I think you know a lot of these findings are very um, impacted by the clinical care that I provide because I think that the research certainly corroborated um, a, a lot of the things that I was seeing with patients that I was seeing and then also um, my colleagues were seeing with their legal clients. Um, my um, organization is unique because we contract both with the Department of Corrections and local jails, as well as um, with the, the immigration detention facility, um, because we have a correctional care unit within our hospital. And so um, it ended up being fairly accidental that we were able to start doing telehealth consultations during the pandemic um, to be able to start offering hormone therapy to folks. And if that connection hadn't existed, I'm, I'm actually not totally sure what the detention facility would have done to try to provide hormone therapy for people. But I, I think across the board, um, what ends up happening is that there's this very lengthy evaluation administrative process that I don't know all the details of or have never been made privy to that then a referral will get placed um, you know, and sent to me to do evaluations. Um, but oftentimes people will have been detained for months before that. Um, and so our sitting in a facility, um, you know, I think experiencing a lot of harm to their physical and mental health, especially if they've previously been treated with hormones for a long period of time. Um, and then um, it, once you know, we make recommendations to start things, there's often limitations in the types of treatments that are available in formulary and immigration detention. Even if there's something that's felt to be medically indicated, it may not be made available by the facility. Frequently, um, lab monitoring that I request is not done at the time of a follow-up visit, or I won't have those results available then to be able to titrate medications and make sure that they're at safe levels or are you know, kind of um, not having any adverse reactions. Um, and then there are certainly issues once folks are released with having sufficient supplies of medications. Um, they often are given a 30 day supply of medications, but if they're relocating to another state and are having to locate a provider and don't have any medical coverage, there often then are huge lapses in their ability to continue any treatments that are started in the detention facility. I'll also say I've had folks who really wanna start hormone therapy, but then are um, reluctant to start um, because they're worried about the irreversible impacts and what is going to happen if they are deported to their home country. So for example, transgender women who are on hormone therapy and have breast development and then are worried about how um, that discordant appearance is going to impact persecution and discrimination and even risk of death in their home country. Um, and so may make the choice not to start hormone therapy for that reason. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm getting some questions in from the audience. So I was going to ask, um, our first question asks, most research seems to focus on trans feminine people who are incarcerated. Do we not have data on trans masculine experiences? So I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in, but Dee, maybe you could share um, your if experience getting data on trans mass people with black and pink. Yeah, I'd love to hear what others said. I just was looking at the Lambda Legal Protected and um, Served Survey, um, and it seems that they had a good number of trans mask people. Um, we we didn't differentiate uh, who the survey was sent to regarding trans mask or trans femme. I think that the Black and Pink Mask membership, uh, there were primarily trans femmes, um, but some trans mask people, I believe, answered it. I have to check the demographics. Um, one of my clients right now, actually I've had two or three clients who are trans men, one that I'm actively investigating right now, um, has dire need for, uh, 
top surgery and has had, and other clients have had delays with accessing HRT and um, have been abused by uh, other people in the facility staff, as well as other um, incarcerated people. And so I do think that some of the issues cut across um, genders. And I think that um, I agree that we don't want there to be an invisibility of the issues facing trans masculine people in, on the inside either. Whoever this is, email me, adlewis at prisonlaw.com. I will send you all the research sites I have about trans masculine people inside. What we do know generally is that trans masculine people face everything that trans them and trans women face inside incredibly high rates of violence, incredibly high rates of discrimination, incredibly high rates of custody and role violations, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of burgeoning research about trans masculine people writ large. Um, as a trans masculine person, please, I would love to talk about this with you. So just shoot me an email. I think with an eye on the time too, I'd like to move to a kind of our closing question, which tries to strike a different tone at the end and give people an action item maybe that they could do after. So what can members of the audience do to support trans people who are in confined settings like prisons, jails, and immigration detention? How can we increase self-determination for people who are incarcerated? And anybody who wants to jump in first, but D Farmer, if you would like to take that first. I'm sure. Um, I think that um I think just to be supportive in any way that your means or resources allow you to do. Um, perhaps it might just be that you're able to uh, reach out to a uh, inmate, trans inmate to uh, communicate with them by correspondence. Um, you know, I have found that myself when I was incarcerated and many of the transgender people that I interview or communicate with today um, spend an enormous amount of time in segregation where they are alone and they do feel that they are alone and it does lead to depression and suicidation. And so I think that just being supportive um, in that way is you know something that we can all do on a very small basis. Yeah, For me, fantastic. I think in general, any policy that focuses on um, increasing the possible outcomes that trans people can seek instead of having trans trans identity be outcome determinative, like if you're trans, you automatically go to this unit, you automatically are segregated, you automatically get X. Having trans be an outcome explosion where you have an explosion of choices about where to go and how to keep yourself safe, which is enshrined in the PREA standards. PREA is all about making sure that trans people um, have their own views of their safety centered in this. And so I think as advocates, the most we can do to resist having single answers or like trans this be like outcome determinative, the more we can have where trans people get to have self-determination and autonomy over their living conditions, over their bodies, et cetera. Um, that is the most important thing I think we can do to honor everyone's individual experience, as well as increase trans people's capacity and resiliency for self-determination inside. And also as a community, like if you want to get involved in this work, if you want to organize and support trans people inside, reach out to anyone on this panel. We would love to plug you into this work. There is no shortage of work and amazing people to meet and hang out with and organize around. So like, please reach out to us if you're interested in this. We want you, we want you fighting alongside, it, alongside us. I yeah, think that's yeah, um, trans, you know, educating the trans people on the inside of what their rights is and so that they can be inspired to pursue, um, you know, and ensuring that they are, they are, you know, receive the rights that they should have and that they are treated with dignity and humanity is extremely important. Yes, absolutely. I wish we could keep talking more. I know there's questions in the, in the Q&A that we weren't able to get to, but unfortunately our time is up today. So I want to say thank you so much, D, D, A, D, and Liz. I know Rachel just put in some links in the chat for mutual aid groups, bail funds, and other things that people can do to uh, against anti-trans attacks in the U.S. that our panelists wanted to share today too as part of that closing question. Um, I'm so appreciative of your time and knowledge that you shared today, and I hope everybody in the audience and our panel has a great rest of their day. Thank you so much. Hey, Will, do you mind if I just um, say really quickly, for any medical folks or behavioral health folks that are in the audience, I encourage you to get trained as a forensic, to do forensic medical exam. Physicians for Human Rights has a great training program that, that um, doubles the chance that people have successful asylum claims when they have those examinations. So great. thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that.
Awesome. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.